Hello and welcome to another Outlaws of Thunder Junction Limited set review. I'm Paul Chion and today we're going to be covering the red cards. Usually the aggressive cards, lots of burn spells. We'll see what happens here. Uh, this is now the fourth video in our kind of installment of uh, limited set review. So I'm going to be a little bit quicker on the explanations, but this is what we're going to be doing for this uh, set review. We're going to be grading everything on an A through F scale and things that are on the A tier are going to be bombs, cards you first pick, you slam it first pick. Uh, examples of, of A tier cards are Aurelia's Vindicator, Izoni, and Cryptic Coat. Moving on to the B tier, we're going to have the good cards. If you're this color, you're never going to cut this card from your deck and you're going to be first picking this often. Examples of good cards or cards in the B tier are Torch to Witness, Neighborhood Guardian, and A Killer Among Us. Then we have the C tier. This is kind of the heart and soul of your deck. You know, the vast majority of the cards in your deck are likely going to be in the C tier. These are the solid cards. Uh, examples of solid C tier cards are Bite Down on Crime, Projector Inspector, and Murder. D, we have filler cards. These are cards you're not super happy playing with, but often they'll serve a function in some capacity. These are cards that are likely going to be cards number 20 to 23 in your deck. Examples of this from MKM Draft are cards like Suspicious Detonation, Griff Not Tracker, and Shady Informant. And then we have the F tier cards. Don't ever put this in your deck. If you do, drop and draft again. As we move forward, we're also going to have a bunch of different mechanics. We did discuss this in the previous videos, but of course, I'm just going to, again, go over this time super quickly. Saddle, it's another take on a crew. What you do is creatures will have a saddle cost. You can saddle your, your mounts, basically, with creatures to match the power level of the number on the saddle, and then you get an extra benefit for plot. You can basically pay the plot cost of a card up front, and then you can cast it at a later turn. You can only do this as a sorcery. Crime, anytime you target your opponent, your opponent's graveyard, or any of your opponent's permanents or spells, you are committing a crime. So there's a lot of things that benefit off of that. And then you have Spree, which is basically modal spells. If you pay more mana, you can get more modes out of the cards that you cast that have Spree on them. Let's say a, sp a Spree spell has plus one, deal two damage, plus two, kill a creature, plus three, uh, draw a card. If you pay plus one, two, and three mana, six extra mana, you can do all three abilities, you kind of mix and match the abilities that you want. But I want to head straight into this. But before we do, I do want to say, if you have been enjoying all this content so far, I did launch a Patreon channel. Uh, that's the best way to support me outside of, of course, hitting the uh, subscribe button. Shout out to all the current patrons. Really do appreciate your support. Like I said, the link is in the description below. All right. I think that's a new record. Let's head straight into the cards. Coming up first here, we have Brimstone Roundup. One in a red enchantment. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token with tap. Target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. This also has a plot cost of two in a red. So the thing with this card is it's basically screaming, hey, this is a build around, of course. And ideally, this is kind of looking to be played in a deck that either has a lot of cheap spells or has a bunch of plot cards. The issue that I see with this card, though, is you don't get anything out of this immediately. If you play this on turn two, you don't get that 1-1 one, one red mercenary token. You need to plot this on turn three, and then on turn four, let's say you play something, then you play this card and you get a 1-1, one, one, and you're kind of slowly building this up over time. This is certainly not the card that you're going to be looking to play in any red deck. This is only a card that you're really going to be wanting to play in a deck with a bunch of cantrips, cheap spells, and ways to plot a lot. And even then, I think the payoff is a little bit underwhelming. So oftentimes when you just look at this card, you're like, hey, this is a signpost uncommon that lets me want to play, that makes me want to play multiple spells every turn. And in this instance, I think this is, if you build around this card and you can make this happen... I still think it's a C-level card, and if you can't build around it at all, this is a D-level card, definitely something you're probably not going to want to play, because if you get two tokens out of this, it's not that great. You need to get at least three before you start actually feeling like you got something out of the kind of in mana investment that you took to play this card. Next on, we have Calamity, Galloping Inferno. So this one I had to read a few times, so we'll read it together. Four and two red for a four six legendary creature horse mount. It has haste, all right? So six mana, four six haste. 
Whenever Calamity Galloping Inferno attacks while saddled, choose a non-legendary creature that saddled it this turn and create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of it. Sacrifice that token at the beginning of the next end step. All right. Repeat this process once. And that's the really important part. And it's got a saddle cost of one, so it's relatively cheap. So when you read this the first time through, it's got a cheap saddle cost. But let's say you saddle this with a big creature, right? Because saddle one doesn't mean you can only use a one power creature. You can over saddle it and put, a, you know, a, something even bigger than Calamity. Uh, although that would look kind of weird. But you can saddle it with a large creature. And the nice thing about that is now all of a sudden, instead of having to attack with a 5-5 five -five into, let's say, your opponent's board that can potentially double or triple block it, you now have a copy of a token that attacks with it, so you're still able to get in for the damage, but you don't lose your creature. But you get to do this twice. So the way that you really get paid off with this card is let's say you saddle a 5-5 five -five, right, with this card. All of a sudden, you're beating in for 4 and two five fives. That gets in for lots and lots of damage. And the fact that this is kind of going to be the last card that you play because it's a six mana card, I mean, you're threatening lots and lots of damage and it's got a lot of toughness. So it's really hard to fight through this and your opponents are gonna have to double block to get this off the battlefield while also having to deal with the double tokens that are also in play. So I feel like for six mana, you're getting a pretty good, you're getting pretty good value for this, right? The turn this comes into play, you're smacking your opponents for a lot. So I think given that, now if you're behind, obviously this card isn't great, but given the upside for the potential to just kill your opponent out of nowhere, I'm going to give this kind of like a B, maybe a low B, because I think the effect is really cool and you can, I just want to see this attack and just attack for, like you just get in an attack for like 15 in one turn with this card, which I think is going to happen. Next up we have Caught in the Crossfire. Red, red for an instant. This is a spree card, so you can pay... Uh, choose one or more additional costs, plus one, caught in the crossfire deals two damage to each outlaw creature, plus one, caught in the crossfire deals two damage to each non-outlaw creature. Man, how good would a two damage to every creature card be in uh, Murders at Karlov Manor? But that's neither here nor there. This is a pretty cool card because this gives you flexibility, right? Like, if you're playing a deck an aggressive deck even, that has a ton of outlaws, which a lot of the red cards have outlaw on, are outlaws, then you can kind of set up a situation where you can kill potentially one or two of your opponent's creatures and have your creatures live. And then, of course, um, vice for, like if there's an instance where your opponents have a bunch of different types of creatures that need, be, need to be killed, you can still pay four mana to do that. But of course, there's also downsides, right? There's instances where you have a mix of creatures and this card isn't that great. Additionally, this card starts out with a double red mana cost, so it's not the easiest spell to ca uh, cast as well. Or sometimes your opponents can just have big creatures. So I think this kind of is the type of card that can have a high ceiling, but a pretty low floor, but there is some flexibility added to it. But given how difficult it is to, ca to cast, I'm going to give Caught in the Crossfire a C. Next, we have the Cunning Coyote. One and a red for a 2-2 haste. I'm in for that. When Cunning Coyote enters the battlefield, another target creature you control gets plus one, plus one, and haste until end of turn. It's got a plot cost of one and a red. So that's the really interesting thing about this card. Two mana, 2-2 two, two haste. Completely solid card, right? That's just a C-level card that you would play in all of your aggressively slanted decks. But the nice thing about this is the fact that you can plot this. And if you plot this... Let's say, for example, on turn two, instead of playing this and attacking, right? If you play this on turn two and you attack, and then you play, and then you attack again on turn three, you're getting in for four damage, right? If you plot this on turn two, and then on turn three, let's say you play a three mana three three, you then you play the three mana three three, then you cast this with plot, and you give the three three haste. This also has haste. Now you're getting in for six instead of four. So this has the potential, at least when you're trying to curve out, to get in for an additional point or two of damage in which helps out a lot. And of course, you can also set this up to give something big haste in the late game as well. So, you know, this has a pretty high floor because like I said, a two mana, two, two haste, I'm playing all day, every day. But at the same time, there's a little bit of an extra bonus uh, for this card because it gives haste. So where do I put this card? I don't think this card is still powerful enough to necessarily put me at the B tier. If I did, it would be a low, low B, but I would put this at high C. Like, this is a card that I'm happy taking fairly early, and in, in if I'm just playing an aggressive red deck, this is something that I always want. If I'm playing maybe more of a defensively or defensive red deck, 
then maybe it's not as good, but it still has plot, right? You can still play multiple spells in one turn, so this card can never really be bad. So pretty big fan of the uh, Cunning Coyote. Next up, we have Deadeye Duelist. One in a red for a 1-3 Human Assassin Reach Creature. So eh, not the best stats. One tap, Deadeye Duelist deals one damage to target opponent. I think we know exactly what this kind of card does. It's a little bit of a defensively oriented card, maybe for a plot deck, right? When you're, when you're playing a deck that's looking to plot, you want creatures with high toughness to kind of survive because oftentimes you're going to be taking a turn off and not adding to the board by plotting a spell. And this is kind of what it's trying to do. But at the same time, I mean, the body is still pretty underwhelming. This is something you never really want to take highly unless you absolutely need two drops. So I'm going to give Deadeye Duelist a D. Next, we have Demonic Ruckus. Some sweet art. That's Rakdos over there giving some beatdowns. One in a red for an enchantment aura. Enchanted creature gets plus one, mount, plus one, menace, and trample. Okay. When Demonic Ruckus is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, draw a card. And it's got a plot cost of just one red mana. So this almost kind of reminds me of um, back in um, Amonkhet, like the cartouches. Because this is a one mana aura. Right? This is a one mana aura that pumps up your creature, and then if your creature dies, then you do get the card back, which is nice. Additionally, because it's so cheap, it allows you to trigger the condition of playing multiple spells in one turn. Because you plot it for one mana, and then that's such a cheap cost that at some point you just play this and anything else, and it's that's a really trivial way to turn on a double spell, right? I mean, even turn three, you can play like a 2-2, two -two and then you plot this. Turn four, you play Lone Shark. Or like you, you, you put this on your creature and then you play Lone Shark, boom, right? You get to draw a card. So that's what's nice about this card. But the, the stats I want to look at, the combat stats that you get from this isn't that exciting to me, right? If you pay this for two mana and you give something plus one, plus one in Menace, that's a big cost, I feel. But the fact that you can do it for red makes it, I think, okay. But like, let's say you're putting this on your two mana creature... Like, just how good is it is kind of my question. So for me, the fact that it doesn't give incredible combat stats, even though it's a pretty efficient card, kind of wants, makes me want to put this in the high C range, but not quite in the B range. I just think there's a lot you can do with this. It's flexible. It replaces itself if they kill your creature. It makes your aggressive creatures kind of hard to block. But because it doesn't, you know, if it gave like plus two, plus zero... I'd like this a lot more, <laughs> but given that it gives plus one, plus one, I just don't know that I want this in all of my decks, so I'll give this a C plus. Moving on, we have Discerning Peddler, one in a red for a 2-2 human rogue. So it is an outlaw. When Discerning Peddler enters the battlefield, you may discard a card. If you do, draw a card. So this is kind of a one-shot rummage effect, and then you're stuck with, you just end up with a kind of a 2-2 body. This card's fine, never really taking this card too highly, unless this card ends up being obscenely fast, and then you just need all the two drops. But kind of, assuming this is just a normal speed set, I'm going to give this card a D. Moving on, a card that's not a D. Explosive Derailment, one red for an instant with Spree, plus two, so for three mana. Explosive Derailment deals four damage to target creature. Sign me up, say no more, say no more. Plus two colorless destroy target artifact. Now, I'm not sure how many artifacts there are in this set. I don't think it matters that much. Well, it matters to the point where if there's a ton of artifacts, obviously this card gets better. But if you just look at this as, and this is a common, red two colorless deals four damage to target creature. I mean, that's going to kill most things that you play from turns one to turn four right? So this is just going to be a very, very solid, efficient removal spell. It's going to be probably one of the top commons in the set. I'm going to give this a high C. Next, we have Ferocification. Two in a red. That is a Jaimungus Squirrel. Enchantment. At the beginning of combat on your turn, choose one. Target creature gets plus... Target creature you control gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. Target creature you control gets Menace and Haste until end of turn. And note that you can only target your creatures because this would probably be a little bit too strong if you can target your opponent's creatures because you would be committing a crime for free every single turn. Just a little knob there. But I think this card's pretty nice. Now, of course, you have to be aggressive, right? You have to be uh, looking to beat people down. But in an aggressive deck, I think this card can do some work. 
And it just makes combat really, really difficult, right? And especially if you're playing a deck that's able to generate tokens, right? If you're able to generate the 1-1 one, one mercenary tokens and you have this in play, even in the late game, you can just pump those up and have them attack as 3-1s. And alternatively, you can just put this on a creature with high power, low toughness, give it menace, and it makes it so that it's really hard for your opponents to trade profit profitably. So I think if you're playing an aggressive deck, this is a C-level card. When it's good, it goes even up to B. But kind of on average, I would say that this is a C-level card and not necessarily something that you're looking to play in every deck, right? If you're plotting and, and uh, trying to draft the two spells in one turn control deck, this is not something that you want. But let's say you're looking to be um, on the more aggressive end of the spectrum, then this is definitely something that you want. Next up, we have the Gila Courser. Two in a red for a 4-2 Lizard Mount. When Gila Courser attacks while saddled, exile the top card of your library. Until the end of your next turn, you may play that card. It's got a saddle cost of one. The really important thing about this card is it's got until the end of your next turn. So that's the really confusing thing that I kind of actually dislike with the these red draw card effects kind of the impulsive spell casting effects is you're never sure if you're you can cast it until the end of the current turn or until the end of the next turn right and in this case it makes sense that uh, you can cast it until the end of your next turn and that's what makes this card much much better because the 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 thought process here is let's say you play this on turn three on an empty board turn four you can still play a creature saddle this up attack right oftentimes this is going to trade for something it's a four two but Let's say you reveal, reveal a 4-mana card. Well, you don't have to worry about it. You already played your creature for this turn, but you can play that card that you revealed on the next turn, which is really nice. So in most instances, when you play this card, you're going to trade with something and draw a card. And that's a card that I'm just happy playing in my deck. So I'm going to give this card a high C. I, I can't imagine like ever cutting this card in my red decks. Next up, we have a pretty uh, exciting and interesting card in Great Train Heist. This is one red for an instant spree spell. Plus two in a red, unt untap all creatures you control. If it's, your combat if it's your combat phase, there is an additional combat phase after this phase. Classic, right? Just uh, this is always a rare. It's always four mana to get this effect. However, there's some extra things about this card that make it more interesting. For plus two... Creatures you control get plus one, plus zero, and gain first strike until end of turn, which is a pretty strong ability. Just three mana to give your entire team plus one, plus zero, and first strike? Like, how disruptive is that going to make combat? It's going to make blocks really tough. Just that by itself, right? One uh, for three mana, giving your entire team plus one, plus one, first strike? That's going to be really tough for your opponent to play around. And then the last mode is plus one red, choose target opponent. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to that player this turn, create a tapped treasure token. So I think that's the least relevant mode on this card. It's just kind of tacked on. But I think you really need to focus on the first two abilities. Now, I think in general, that first ability, untap all creatures you control and uh, there's an extra combat. It's not the strongest thing. You, you don't, it's, 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 not, it's not something that you want to just put in your deck. However, in conjunction with... That second ability, that's when things get really interesting. Because I feel like this is the type of card, just red plus two, give all your things uh, plus one, plus zero oh in first strike. If you're an aggressive deck, I think this is a card you just always play. It's just a really solid combat trick. You know, you, you just attack with like four creatures and you have this in your hand. What, what do they do, right? They can't even trade, right? It's not like this is a trumpet blast effect where all your creatures just get plus two, plus zero. Oh. All your creatures get first strike, which means some creatures are going to trade, but some of your creatures are just going to win out on combat. And then when you get to six mana, right? When you get to six mana and you cast this card, it's like a pseudo overrun, right? You, you attack, and this is an instant. Your opponent's block. You cast this for six mana. All your things get first strike, right? Uh... Presumably, many of your opponent's creatures have died from the first strike. A lot of your creatures are going to survive because they do have first strike. And then you're going to get to attack again. So I think there's enough upside here along with that first strike that I'm going to be optimistic here and give Great Train Heist a B. I'm going to give this card a B because I'm a dreamer. But a B if you're looking to be aggressive. But red's usually aggressive. All right. Next, we have Hell to Pay. Red X Sorcery. Let me guess what this card does. Hell to Pay deals X damage to target creature. 
Create a number of tapped treasure tokens equal to the amount of excess damage dealt to that creature this way. So this is just red X sorcery, deal X damage to target creature. How good is that card? You're always trading down on mana. You're always trading down on mana. So honestly, if this, if this, if it was just red X sorcery, deal X damage to target creature, I think that's just a C level card, right? It's not particularly exciting. I mean, Slice from the Shadows was black X instant, uncounterable, right? And that was a C level card in that format. So given that, I think that's kind of the baseline that you have to start with. But this does give you a little bit more upside because th this card can potentially ramp you. If you're, you're looking to use this card to kill something small, all of a sudden, you get to create a bunch of treasures that you can lose for, use for a future turn. But how often are you going to do that? I think the most common thing that this is going to do in a lot of instances is, hey, I'm going to use this. I'm going to kill. I'm going to spend like five mana. Maybe I'll kill your three toughness creature, and then I'll get a treasure to um, treasure left over. So I think there are dreams with this card where you look at this card and you're like, oh man, I'm going to have 10 mana. I'm going to kill their like three, three, and I'm going to get six treasures and I'm going to go off. But then you already have 10 mana right? So just like, there's no point where I'm super excited about this card. So I'm going to just give this card a C, maybe a C plus, just because there are instances when you can use the treasure. But I don't think it's especially uh, uh, special given that you can't go to the face. Now, if this goes to the face, boom, straight to B territory. But uh, given that it's only creatures, uh, I'm actually a little bit surprised that this is a rare. All right, moving on, we have Hellspur Brute, four and a red for a 5-4 Trampler, and it has affinity for outlaws. This spell costs one less to cast for each assassin, mercenary, pirate, rogue, and or warlock you control. And if you look at the if you look through the set, there are a fair number of outlaws in the set. Many of most of the red creatures are outlaws. And there's a common that we're gonna get to. It's gonna be the best common in the set, or best common in this color at least, um, that actually creates two mercenaries. So can you imagine if you played Prickly Pear turn three, we're going to get to it later, and then you play this for three mana? That's insane. And I think just on average, if you play kind of a deck, I think on average you can kind of expect this in most decks to be a four mana, five, four trampler. And that's something that I'm very interested in, right? That hits really hard. And there are some instances where you're just going to, let's say you just draw this turn five randomly right? And you have a bunch of outlaws in play. You can play this for like two mana and then play another threat and then your opponents just get completely run over. So I think because of the fact that this hits hard and because I think there's just going to be enough outlaws in this format, I'm going to give Hellspur Brute a B. This is kind of a beating. This is kind of a beating. I mean, not to mention if you go like one drop, two drop outlaw, I don't know how often that happens, but if you go one drop, two drop outlaw into this, I mean, that's just game, right? It's so hard to come back from that. All right, next up we have Hellspur Posse Boss. Two and two red for a 2-4 Lizard Rogue. Other outlaws you control have haste. When Hellspur Posse... Okay, hold on. When, I was going to say Posse Boss. Uh, when Hellspur Posse Boss... Okay, they're doing this just to... It's, this is a tongue twister. Hellspur Posse Boss. Try to say that three times. All right, enters the battlefield. Create two one-run red mercenary creature tokens... With tap, target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn, activate only as a sorcery. So this is a four mana, two, four that ETBs and gives you two mercenaries. Those mercenaries have haste. So if you have other outlaws in play, you can pump them up or you can attack for two. There's just so many things that you can do and any outlaws that you play afterwards have haste. I mean, this card is awesome. It's a four mana card that gives you four power, six toughness and stats with a great static ability. And the two one ones you create are not just one ones. They actually have, rel they actually have a relevant ability. Hellspur Posse Boss is the first A that I'm going to give for the red cards here at Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Moving on. Highway Robbery. One in a red. Sorcery. You may discard a card or sacrifice a land. If you do, draw two cards. Plot for a one in a red. So... There's instances where you can kind of set this up where you plot. Oftentimes when you do this, you don't need to cast it right away and then you can double spell and what have you. But effects like this just haven't been particularly strong historically. We've had this at instant speed before and it still wasn't that great, right? Demand answers from the last set. So this card is just kind of a filler card. If you do want to cast multiple spells in one turn, I can see this being played in some kind of a blue-red spells deck, but I'm going to start this card out as a D. 
Next up, we have Irascible Wolverine. Is it Irascible or Irascible? Irascible Wolverine. Two in a red for a 3-2 Wolverine. When Irascible Wolverine enters the battlefield, exile the top card of your library. Until end of turn, you may play that card. So this, unlike the previous red saddle creature that we saw, this one you have to play it immediately. And the, the, the cool thing about this is that it has plot two in a red. Because if you play this just face up turn three as a three two, you're not going to be able to play that card, right? If you play it late, sure. But the, the kind of idea behind this card is you want to plot this card. And then when you play it later, on turn four, for example, you play this for free. And then you can, you can basically draw a card. So it's kind of like a loan shark in that sense, right? It's kind of like a loan shark, but it's cheaper. So it's actually not a terrible card. And then, you know, worst case scenario, you can still play it as a three mana three two if you feel like you're getting run over. So I think this is a solid role player in the red decks that you're going to play. And I'm going to give the Wolverine a C. Next up, we have Iron Fist Pulverizer. Four and a red for a four five giant warrior with reach. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, Iron Fist Pulverizer deals two damage to target opponent and scry one. So this is a card you're never going to have to take early. You'll end up with maybe one or two copies. This, this is literally the definition of a D-level card. You're going to play this as your 23rd card in probably your uh, play multiple spells type deck. It's the top end of your curve. It helps you stabilize a little bit. It's got reach, but it's not something you're ever taking early. This is um, just exactly, just, just, this just swims. This just chills out in kind of that D tier, and it's comfortable there. It's like, I don't, I don't need to leave. I, I know what I'm here for. I know what my role is. And uh, that's to be just a solid role player in uh, the, the late game of uh, my decks. All right, moving on. Longhorn, Longhorn Sharpshooter, two and a red for a 3-3 three, three reach Minotaur Rogue. That's just solid stats. When Longhorn Sharpshooter becomes plotted, it deals two damage to any target. Plot, three and a red. So if I'm reading this correctly, and I've misread some of these cards in the past... When you plot this on turn four, you immediately get to deal two damage to something, which is, you know, obviously mana value wise, it's not great. But then afterwards, you get a 3-3 three, three with reach. So it's kind of like a delayed 3-3 three, three reach creature that enters the battlefield and deals two damage. This card is incredible. This card is awesome. You slam it. This is likely going to be one of the best uncommons in the set, if not the best uncommon in the set. I'm giving this a high B for Longhorn Sharpshooter. Love this card. All right, moving on, we have Magda the Horde Master. One in a red for a 2-2 legendary creature, Dwarf Berserker. Whenever you commit a crime, create a tapped treasure token. This ability triggers only once each turn. Sacrifice three treasures, create a 4-4 red dragon creature token with flying and haste. Activate only as a sorcery. So my real question here is how many other things in the format create treasures? Because you want to be able to create that dragon as quickly as possible. Because if you do, this card has an A-level ceiling. The question is, how often are you able to do that? If you remove that, and you're just looking at a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two that gets you a treasure every time you commit a crime, that's just a really, really solid card, right? That's just a card that, I mean, it's basically... I guess it basically becomes kind of a mana creature at that point, right? It becomes a mana creature because you play it... And then you make some treasures, and then you turn this into a, um, you know, you, you, you turn this into just something that generates treasures and gives you mana every single turn. But the problem is, this also creates tapped treasure tokens, right? So you can't use the mana right away. You can't use the mana right away. But of course, getting that dragon is really powerful. So how easy is it going to be for you to commit three crimes? And how many other permanents in your deck create treasures? Even if you can't, it's still a solid card. But because I think this isn't a card that just gives you that dragon right away and you need to work for it and it gives your opponent kind of a window to be able to kill this before you can go off, I don't think I can put Magna into the A tier, but it is a must kill. It is very good. I'm going to put Magna the Horde Master at B. Next up, we have Mage Bane Lizard. One in a red for a 1-4 Lizard. Whenever a player casts a non-creature spell, Mage Bane Lizard deals damage to that player equal to the number of non-creature spells they've cast this turn. It is a 2-mana 1-4 that every now and then you get to deal 1 damage to them with the ping effect. No thank you. I mean, it's just, it's just kind of a pretty rough body. I'm not interested in this card. Sure, like, 
If you're lucky, you can deal like four damage to your opponent in a game with this, and then you have a 1-4 body. If you need a blocker, I guess you can play it, but I'm not the most excited about this card. I'm going to give Mage Bane Lizard a D. Next up, we have Mine Raider. Two and a red for a 3-2 human rogue. It is an outlaw with Trample. All right. When Mine Raider enters the battlefield, if you control another outlaw, create a treasure token. So... That's pretty nice, right? If you can get a treasure every time, this card is pretty sweet. It's like a C-plus level card. But, of course, there's just going to be plenty of instances where you don't. I'm just going to assume that, on average, this probably makes you a treasure like half the time. Something along those lines. But even that is pretty decent. And it, it rumbles, but 3-mana, three 3-2 three, Trample is not the most exciting stats regardless. I would give this card a C. I mean, if I'm playing kind of a red aggressive deck, it's going to get me a treasure some amount of the time. And it still gets in there, so just... A fine card to play in your deck, but certainly it's something that I'm not slamming early. Next up, we have Outlaw's Fury. Two and a red for an instant. Creatures you control get plus two, plus zero until end of turn. All right. This is the go-wide common of the set. If you control in Outlaw, exile the top card of your library until the end of your next turn, you may play that card. So that last, I need you to focus on that last line of text once again. It's extremely important because normally Trumpet Blast is kind of a D-level card that you play in your deck and it's only really good if you can go wide, right? If you can go really wide, if you play a bunch of prickly pairs, you play have a bunch of ways to make the 1-1 mercenary tokens, then you can play this as like a one-of, as a finisher, if you can go wide very quickly. But the reason why this card is significantly better is this is more like On The Job or Auspicious Arrival. This replaces itself, right? You play this card, and if you're playing this card in your deck, you're going to have a bunch of outlaws in your deck, right? Because you're looking to play, you're looking to go wide and have a bunch of tokens. And in that particular deck, when you cast this card, right, you don't need to just win the game on the spot. You just play it, you trade some stuff, right? You're probably going to trade profitably or at least like, you know, trade your 2-2 and trade up on some things. And then you still have a card to show for it at the end of all of this. So I think this is just a C-level card. Granted, you can trigger that last effect. If you can't, this is a D. And here we have it here. The best common in red. I mean, if if history serves, is, serves any indication, any creature that's cheap and makes another token typically ends up being one of the best commons in the set. Let's look at the last set. Dog Walker, Inside Source, Person of Interest. They were all among the highest win rate cards in the format. And I don't think it's going to be much different here. There's synergies in the set that actually want you to have mercenaries in play. And it's also really great with Outlaw's Fury, right? Let's say you just play a couple of Prickly Pairs and then you attack them with Outlaw's Fury. That's going to be incredible. Let's say you play Prickly Pair with that 5-mana five 5-4 five Trampler. If you play Prickly Pair, the 5-mana five 5-4 five Trampler becomes a 3-mana five 5-4 Trampler. So I think Prickly Pair is going to be awesome. It's also just not a 3-mana 2-2 that makes a 1-1. One, one. You have to remember that this 1-1 one, one actually has a relevant ability. It allows you to turn your 2-2s two into 3-2s and trade into um, you know creatures that are more defensively slat, uh, slot, uh, slanted. So I think this card is going to be great. I'm going to give Prickly Pear a C+, but I would not be shocked if this somehow ends up being the best common in the set and ends up in the B range. Moving on, we have Quick Draw. One red instant target creature you control gets plus one, plus one, and first strike until end of turn. Creature's target opponent controls lose first strike and double strike until end of turn. So for the most part, this is just one red target creature you control gets plus one, plus one, and first strike until end of turn. Um, I do think, uh, and I think Sam Party mentioned this on Twitter, that he just thought it was a flavor fail that the name of this card is Quick Draw. And if you have a Quick Draw and your opponents have a Quick Draw and you cast yours first, Somehow it's actually worse, whereas when you're dueling somebody, the person who dr quick draws first is the one who wins. So I feel like that's a little bit weird. Um, anyways, um, I think this is just a D-level combat trick. It's just not that exciting. It's just one red for one creature, so not super excited about this card. Next, we have Quill the Charger. Three and a red for a 4-3 Porcupine Mount. Whenever Quill Charger attacks, while saddled, it gets plus one, plus two, and gains Menace until end of turn. It's got a saddle cost of two. So that means this is a four mana, four, three, that when you saddle an attack, it's a five, five Menace creature. So this thing hits really hard. Now, it's not the best on defense, right? It's a four mana, four, three. 
But if you're on the play, I mean, a lot of these saddle cards want you to be on the play. I mean, everything in Magic wants you to, wants you to be on the play. But if you're on the play, this thing's really hard and really, really difficult to block, particularly if you have some kind of a combat trick to follow that up. So I think if you're just going to be an aggressive deck, this is certainly a card you are happy playing in your four mana slot. Going to give this a solid C. Moving on, we have Reckless Lackey. One red for a 1-2 Goblin Pirate with First Strike and Haste. So an Outlaw with one mana, one, two, First Strike and Haste. Okay. Two and a red. Sacrifice Reckless Lackey, draw a card and create a treasure token. I, I mean, that is a pushed one drop. Holy cow. That is a pushed one. Can this even make Constructed? I mean, look at this card. One mana, one, two, First Strike, Haste. For a deck, that, if that if you're playing a deck that's looking to beat down, this card is incredible, right? This card is just incredible. I mean, I'll take this over the the goat from the last set any day. This card is great if you're aggressive, and honestly, if your opponent somehow managed to stabilize, you still get to just. I I don't understand why this has the fail safe of being able to just sacrifice to draw a card and make a treasure in the late game. I I just feel like it might not even necessarily need that. But anyways, this card is a solid one drop creature. And a one-drop creature that even I, somebody who doesn't like playing that many one-drops, would play in my deck. Reckless Lackey gets a C, possibly even a C+. Moving on, we have Resilient Roadrunner. One and a red for a 2-2, better have haste. Oh, it's got haste and protection from coyotes. That is fantastic. Love the favor. Lo love the flavor, rather. Oh, man, that is great. Protection from coyotes. I don't know how relevant it is, but I just love the fact that it does. All right, three colorless, resilient roadrunner. Can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste. I don't, I don't know that that's going to come up that often. I don't even know that protection from, from coyotes comes up that often. But hey, it's still a two mana, two, two haste. That's a card that you're always going to put in your deck. So this is going to be a C for me. Next up, we have Return to Favor. This is a really interesting card. Red, red, instant, spree. Plus one, copy target instant spell, sorcery spell, Activated ability or triggered ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. Plus one, change the target of target spell or ability with a single target. So this is kind of another take on those fork variants where you get to copy spells, but they also added activated abilities and triggered abilities to give it a little more application. Additionally, you have the flexibility of using this to redirect a, a spell that, for example, an opponent might cast. If your opponent plays a removal spell, you can pay three mana to redirect that removal spell onto something else. If you have four mana, you can copy that removal spell that they cast and redirect their removal spell and then kill two of their creatures. So that's the ceiling, right? That's the ceiling. The floor is there's just no spells to copy, right? Like the thing is, if you're trying to copy your own spell, this is just really expensive, right? You need to have the mana to be able to play a spell, then pay three mana to copy that spell. And that doesn't happen that often unless you're unless the spell is a plotted spell, right? So I feel like this is a card that can be situationally great, but I just don't know that it's consistently good enough for me to necessarily want to play it. I think this could be a really good sideboard card against, let's say, like a black deck with a ton of removal spells. You can board this in, and I think it's going to be like a B-level card in those matchups if you play a control deck, but not something that I necessarily would feel comfortable starting in most of my decks. I think on average, this card's probably going to be like a D or a D+. Plus. Moving on, Rodeo Pyromancers. Three and a red for a 3-4 Human Mercenary. Whenever you cast your first spell each turn, add two red. I think kind of the, the thing with this card, uh, you're not really wanting to play this in your aggressive deck. You want to play that porcupine all day, every day over something like this. But in the deck that's looking to cast multiple spells in a turn, this definitely makes it a lot easier, right? Because you play this and then on the next turn, you can play a spell and everything basically, the, that first spell costs two less and then you can kind of cast multiple spells a turn. So I think in that particular deck, you this card could have a home, but it's something that you're going to table. You're never taking this early. This is just a solid D-level card. Kind of like that 5-mana 4-5 reach. Like, you'll play it in your double spells deck, uh, potentially, if you need something. And you really need a way to kind of, like, uh, turbocharge your ability to cast multiple spells. But because the body is so irrelevant and it doesn't do anything the turn it comes into play, not super excited about this card. 
Next up, we have Scalestorm Summoner. Two in a red for a 3-3 human warlock. When Scalestorm Summoner attacks, create a 3-1 red dinosaur creature token if you control a creature with power 4 or greater. So, you have to go through some hoops. You need to be able to have a 4 power creature in play. Uh, when you play this on turn 3, let's say you play a 4 power creature on turn 4, like the porcupine. Then you attack with this card and all of a sudden you have 6 power and 4 toughness worth of stats for 3 mana. That's an awesome rate, right? So I think this is a card where you need to be mindful of the fact that you should have four power creatures in your deck. You want to be like red-green, for example. That's probably the easiest way to turn this on. And if you can ever just like have to survive a combat and make two tokens, I mean, that's just incredible. But I think as is, if you have a deck that can reasonably put four power creatures into play, let's say you have like five four power creatures in your deck, I would give this card a B just because you're getting a lot of power and stats out of just a three drop. Next up, we have Scorching Shot. Very simple. Red, red, sorcery. Scorching Shot deals five damage to target creature. That's effectively just kill target creature for red, red. So I'm gonna just give this a solid B. This is also cheap. Red, red is makes it hard to cast, but the nice thing about red, red is that it allows you to double spell, right? Even if you can't necessarily cast this on turn two, I don't even know if you wanna cast this on turn two anyways, right? You wanna be killing bigger creatures with this, but the fact that it only costs two mana means that on turn four or turn five, you can go Scorching Shot plus something and then trigger your play two spells in one turn ability that you might have in play. Solid B here for the Scorching Shot. Moving on, we have a Slick Shot Show Off. One in a red for a 1-2 Flying Haster. Bird Wizard. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, Slick Shot Show Off gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. Plot one in a red. All right. So the plot is nice just in the sense that you can just, of course, use this to, ca uh, to double spell. Uh, but this is, particular this is definitely a card that you don't, you don't just necessarily play in every deck. This is definitely the type of card that you want to play in a deck that's playing a bunch of spells, right? Perhaps there is a blue-red spells deck that you can play and you play this card, right? And if you have a deck that has a lot of spells and you can trigger it pretty frequently, yeah, this card can definitely do some work. So I think on average, this is just generally going to be like a C-level card. Let's say you're just playing a deck with like, I don't know, six spells or something like that, right? Then it's not particularly exciting. But in the deck that's playing 10 spells, right? Or let's say you're playing a deck with spells that make creatures, for example. And this eventually, this kind of has like super prowess, right? Every turn, if you play something, then now you're looking at a two mana, three, two flyer, which is a pretty great rate. So I think in those decks, this can go up to kind of that B-level territory, but you really have to have the deck for it. So it's kind of a special card because most of my decks nowadays, I like to draft a deck with a very high creature count. So cards like this aren't great. But like I said, if I'm playing a blue-red deck and I'm committing a bunch of crimes, this is an excellent uh, kind of beater for those uh, kind of tempo-style spell decks. Moving on, we have Stingerback Terror. Two red-red for a Flying Trampler. It's a 7-7. Okay, I mean, there's got to be a drawback, right? Stingerback Terror gets minus one, minus one for each card in your hand, and it's got a plot cost of two and a red. So, what are we looking at here? Just on average, right? Like, what are we expecting out of this card? Well, obviously, if you draw it in the late game, this thing is ridiculous, right? If you draw this in the late game and you have like one or, one or no cards left in your hand, this is a four mana, six, six, or seven, seven trampler. That's tremendous, right? But let's say you're on the play, okay? Opening hand, seven cards. Play a land, six. Turn two, go to seven, play a land, play a two drop, okay? You have five cards in hand. Turn three, you draw a card. Play a land, play a three drop. Down to four cards. Turn four, draw a card. Play a land, play Stingerback Terror. That's three cards in your hand. So on turn four, on turn four, in most instances, assuming you didn't play a one drop, in most instances, this will likely be a 4-4 Flying Trampler on turn four. But that's like the floor, almost, right? If you stumble a little bit, sure, you you know, maybe it can be a 3-3 Flying Trampler, but then you have the ceiling of this card just being a 7-7 Flying Trampler that just completely takes over the game. Not to mention the fact that you can plot this, you can play this later, you can drop, you can play more cards later on turn four, like you can plot this on turn three, then you're looking at a card, it didn't enter the battlefield, but you plotted this on turn three, and then on turn four, you play a four drop and this as your 4-4 Flyer, that's incredible. Now, this card gets a little bit worse on the draw because it becomes a 4-mana 3-3 Flying Trampler, but then you just kind of wait. You, you just 
the, the, nothing about this card says you have to play this on turn four. You just play everything else first, and all of a sudden, you just have this gigantic flying, trampling, beating of a dragon that's going to just win the game very, very quickly. I'm going to give Stinger back Terror in A. I think this card just hits hard enough where I'm going to want to take it. I think um, if you are going to try to compare this to Krenko's Buzz Crusher, it's much better than that. First of all, it's not an artifact, so you can't just randomly snipe it with Vengeful Creeper. But secondly, there is just far more upside to this card. It's got plot. You can play this later. It can be bigger. There's just a lot more you can do with this card than something like the Buzz Crusher. Next up, we have Take for a Ride. Two and a red for a sorcery. Take for a Ride has flash as long as you've committed a crime this turn. Gain control of target creature until end of turn. Untap that creature. It gains haste until end of turn. So that, by itself, two and a red, Threaten. How good is that card? Well, typically, if I'm playing an aggressive deck, it's okay, but I don't really like it that much. Where I really like that effect is a sacrifice strategy. Let's say I'm playing Rakdos Sacrifice, right? And I have uh, multiple ways to sacrifice creatures. Then I really like this card, right? Then I really like this card because then I can steal your creature, uh, hit you with it, and then I can sacrifice it for value. That's when this card I would take pretty highly. But this card has an extra twist because if you can commit a crime at inst like on your opponent, so let's say your opponent attacks you, you like with three creatures, you sp spend two mana to kill one of their creatures. All of a sudden you committed a crime. Then what can you do? You can cast take for a ride at instant speed, steal one of their attacking creatures, then block the other creature with it. And then if they're both three threes, boom, you've just killed everything. Right? So that is the ultimate ceiling for this card. But unlike effects like this in the past, because there have been effects like this in the past and they were all completely busted, there was no conditional way to do it. Before, for example, this card is the same as Ray of Command. It was a three and a blue instant, really old card. And it would do a similar thing. But there, there was no qualifier. You didn't have to commit a crime, right? Here, you're gonna need to, need to like have a cheap spell to cast while also having the mana to cast that spell plus take for a ride to steal your opponent's creature. So I think it's the setup cost is difficult enough to be able to pull that off where it's not going to be in that B-level territory. If this was just three mana instant speed steal their thing, absolutely that would be awesome. But it isn't. You need to play a card and then play this to be able to get that effect. So I think in a sacrifice deck, this is a pretty solid card. And if you can commit crimes pretty trivially with cheap spells, this can also be okay. I'm going to kind of put this, if you can do that, kind of in that C to C plus tier. Next, we have Terror of the Peaks. Three, red, red for a 5-4 flyer. Spells your opponents cast that target Terror of the Peaks cost an additional three life to cost to, to cast. It's basically got um, kind of like ward pay three life, which is great. So five mana for a 5-4 player, 5-4 flyer rather, that is uh, that taxes your opponent when they try to kill it. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. So in any set, this card is an A, okay? Because it's a 5-mana five 5-4 five flyer that's already solid, that's hard to kill, in the sense that you take damage when you kill it. But then if you ever play a creature afterwards, you just straight up win the game, almost, right? You play this, you untap, you play a 4-4, four four, and you kill their thing. I mean, that's just way too much value. That's too hard to come back from. But what makes this card even better in this format is the fact that in normal limited sets, you play this card turn five, there's at least a window for your opponent to react. Like if they have a sorcery speed removal spell, they can still kill your Terror of the Peaks and you don't get any value out of it. But plot exists in this format, right? So because plot exists in this format, say you uh, plot a Lone Shark on turn four, right? Turn five, you play Terror of the Peaks, and then you play the Lone Shark. So it's so easy to set up a scenario where Terror of the Peaks enters the battlefield, and then you play one of your plotted creatures, and you get immediately value out of this. So this card is awesome, slam dunk A, and even better in this format than it would be in others. Next up, we have Thunder Salvo. One in a red instant Thunder Salvo deals X damage to target creature, where X is two plus the number of other spells you've cast this turn. So for the most part, I mean, early on, this is a two mana deal two damage spell. That's fine. And then, of course, there's upside here where I think most of the time you're going to be dealing two damage with this. But, you know, maybe 25% of the time uh, you will also be able to deal three damage with this. And 
uh, if you can do that, that's a pretty solid card. So just, you know, I don't ever see myself cutting this for the most part in any of my decks. So I'm going to give this a C. Just solid removal spell, two, ma two drop, you can kill whatever you need. And then you can also set up a scenario where you can deal uh, um, three damage. Next up, we have Trick Shot. Four and a red, instant. Trick Shot deals six damage to target creature and two damage to up to one other target creature token. So this is a five mana instant that effectively kills anything that you want. And then every now and then you can kill a token, but I wouldn't necessarily count on that. That's going to be fairly rare. It's, I mean, at, the, at this point, I just feel like this is just not the type of removal spell that you want to play. Just five mana is just way too much. There are instances where this is going to be very good, where you can kill something big and, and kill a 1-1 token. But I think just more often than not, you're just going to be wanted, wanting to play anything else over something like this. I'm not a big fan of Trick Shot. I'm going to give this a D. Now we're getting to the big score cards. We have Generous Plunderer. One in a red for a 2-2 Menace. I like that. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may create a treasure token. I really like that. When you do, target opponent creates a tapped treasure token. I like that less. Whenever Generous Plunderer attacks, it deals damage to defending player equal to the number of artifacts they control. So let's just assume that your opponent's just not going to have any other artifacts in play. This card is still really good. Two mana for a 2-2 Menace. Very, very happy to play that in my deck. It's a rogue, right? It's, a, it's an outlaw. That's good. And then... At, in, on your upkeep, you create a treasure token. So what that means is on turn two, you play this as a 2-2. On turn three, you create a treasure. Right? You, 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 um, you may create a treasure. Oh, excuse me. I, I reread this. You may create a treasure. So that's the thing. You don't even need to make a treasure if you don't have to, if you don't want to ramp your opponent. So then you get a two-mana, two-two menace, which is just a really solid creature. But if you do make a treasure, your opponent also gets a treasure. So you're at least just even there. Right? but you get to spend that mana first. So what you do is you have the two mana, two, two menace, you make a treasure, they get a tap treasure, they can't use that mana. You can play a four drop on your turn. You attack for two. This thing has menace. It can't be blocked really early. And then because their treasure is tapped, you're also dealing an extra point of damage. So this is almost like a two mana, three, two menace creature that has the ability to give you a treasure and your opponent a treasure. And your opponent, of course, has to at least sacrifice that artifact or use that every tre uh, treasure every turn or else they're going to continue taking damage from the Generous Plunder. So I think this card is great. Uh, solid, solid two drop that you want to play in your decks. I don't think it quite gets to the A territory, but a solid, solid B here for the Generous Plunderer. Moving on, we have Legion Extruder. One in a red for an artifact. When Legion Extruder enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to any target. All right. I mean, that's a, a low C-level card. Two tap, sack another artifact, create a 3-3 three, three Golem artifact creature token. So you can't sacrifice itself. You can sack other artifacts. And, you know, I, the, for, the thing is, I just... It's weird because all the cards from the big score refer to other artifacts... But when I'm looking at the commons and uncommons, I'm just not seeing anything that generates artifact to creatures in any way. But we're going to, of course, have to get to the artifact section to see just how good this card can be. If there are things like, but the thing is, there's no commons that's generating like clues or map tokens or anything like that. If that were the case, this would be better. But because it doesn't, I just assume that this is just not going to happen that often. So then you just have to look at it in the context of ETB deals two damage to any target. And for that, I'll give this a C minus, right? I'll give this a C minus. Just don't, you don't have to take this card that highly unless somehow we get to the artifact section and there's a ton of great artifacts. All right, next up, we have Memory Vessel. Three red, red, artifact, tap, exile Memory Vessel. Each player exiles the top seven cards of their library. Until your next turn, players may play cards. They exile this way and they can't play cards from their hand. Activate only as a sorcery. So I really just in general dislike effects where you have to put a bunch of mana in and your opponents both draw seven cards. Because then you're just kind of even in terms of the things that you can do. This also says until your next turn. So your opponents get a turn to play spells as well, right? So I just think playing five mana for something that doesn't affect the board and then like 
makes you even on cards is just not something that I would advise playing. So I'm going to give Memory Vessel, I think it's a really cool card, but I'm going to give Memory Vessel an F. Don't put this in your deck. Next up, we have Molten Duplication, one in a red for a sorcery. Create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. It gains haste until end of turn. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. No thanks. This is just kind of like you're using this as a pseudo burn spell if you somehow manage to have a giant creature in play and then you get them. I just don't see where when I would ever want a card like this. I'm giving this also an F. Next up, Territory Forge, four in a red, with artifact. When Territory Forge enters the battlefield, if you cast it, exile target artifact or land. Territory Forge has all activated abilities of the exile card. All right, that's three Fs in a row. Three Fs in a row. Don't play this card. Don't take it. Don't put it in your deck. This card is bad. All right, now we are at the bonus sheet cards. Collective Defiance. Oh man, it's been a minute since I've seen this card. One red red with Escalate. Pay this cost for each mode chosen beyond the first. So this is almost a spree. But for this one, you get the first ability. The f you get to cast one of the spells for the casting cost, right? So this is very, very similar to spree though. Choose one or more. Target player discards all the cards in their hand and draws that many cards. All right, if you have a situation where you have a bunch of lands, I guess that could work. Collective Defiance deals 4 damage to target creature. In for that. Collective Defiance deals 3 damage to target opponent. Yeah, that can also be relevant. All right, so the floor of this card is 1 red red deal 4 damage to target creature at sorcery speed. That's a solid removal spell. That's a C. But the fact that it also has, for every mana you pay in addition to that, you get to deal 3 damage to the opponent. And then you can also set up a scenario where you can kind of like loot through your lands in the late game to find something better, I think could potentially get this up to a low B, or low B card, right? Because you can use this to kind of burn your opponent out and then also filter through a couple of cards. I think all those cards, like when you add them up on top of the fact this is a three mana, four damage spell can get you kind of to the low B range. Next up, we have Crackle with Power. This card is wild. I actually wasn't playing when this card came out or I didn't play the set that this card came out in. Red, red, XXX. It's got that uh, doppelganger casting cost. Sorcery, Crackle with Power deals five times X damage to each of up to X targets. All right, so let me break, the, break it down here. Let me, let me just, so if X equals one, you get to deal five damage to one target. And that's four or five mana. If X equals two, that's eight mana, you get to deal 10 damage to up to two targets. If X equals three, you get to deal 15 damage to three targets. Now X equals three is basically never gonna happen or almost never going to happen. I think what you have to look at this card is the, 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 like, the floor of this is like five mana deal five damage at sorcery speed to kill something. That's a pretty bad card. That's kind of a D level card, but that's the thing though. You can do that. And then if you get to eight mana, you can randomly kill your opponents. Right? You can just 10 them, 10 ball their face, and kill their creature. Like, if you do that, even if it's not enough, you've killed a creature and you've dealt 10 to them, you're likely going to be able to finish them off with whatever creatures you have left, right? So, I think for that reason, it's, you know, I, I'm really not sure. This is not as good as Doppelgang, I will say that. It is not, like, Doppelgang ended up being an A. This, this, but I do think... Given the fact that if you can get to 8 mana and build your deck around it, the fact that you can just kill your opponents in a lot of instances, I'm going to give this card a B. Let me know how incorrect I am about this card. Perhaps this ended up being something completely absurd, but I'm going to give this card a B to start just because of how expensive it is. But um, I'm willing to be, I'm, I would be super excited to find out that I'm wrong and this card ends up being better than that. Next up, we have Electro Dominance. Red, red X for an instant. Electro Dominance deals X damage to any target. You may cast a spell with mana value X or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. So this is an instant speed fireball that you can target anything, but you are very, very down on... Well, you would be down on mana if you cast this. Let's say you kill... For five mana, you kill a 3-3. Three, three. But the thing is, you're not down on mana if you can use that extra line of text, right? If you can use the fact that this then allows you to play a 3-drop from your hand, 
then this goes a long way. Not only that, unlike the other X spell that we saw earlier at rare that only goes to creatures, this can also potentially go to the face. So I think there's enough going on here where I can give Electro Dominance a low B because it can finish off your opponents, but it is not the most efficient removal spell, but it's a, it's a decent finisher and it gives you that flexibility to go to the face or to a creature and the fact that you can play something off of this helps as well given the fact that it is kind of an inefficient spell. Next, we have Fling. One in a red, instant. I don't know why this is a bonus sheet card. Uh, as an additional cost to cast a spell, sacrifice a creature. Fling deals damage equal to the sacrifice creature's power to any target. I mean, this is a D. You're just not going to want to play this in most of your decks. However, there is a sacrifice sub-theme. So if you do end up drafting the sacrifice deck, and let's say you pick up a couple of copies of the, the uncommon threaten effect, uh, that's red then you can certainly play fling, right? Then if you see the fling, you can take it, but I'm not gonna start my draft trying to take a fling and trying to do the thing. This is something you're naturally gonna get late. I would say that it's a D, and if you're the sacrifice deck and you have enough ways to make it good, then it gets up to a C. Next, we have Indomitable Creativity, Red, 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 X. This is a very popular, I believe, modern deck. Destroy, or is it a pioneer deck? I'm not sure. Destroy X target artifacts and or creatures. For each permanent destroyed this way, its controller reveals cards from the top of their library until an artifact or creature card is revealed and exile that card, exiles that card. Those players put the exile cards onto the battlefield, then shuffle. This is a sorcery. So basically it's like a super polymorph type effect where you target your creature and then you reveal cards from the top of your library until you hit something else. You don't ever really want to target your opponent's creatures unless they have a bomb. But honestly, I mean, you're kind of just like spinning a roulette wheel. You don't know if you're going to get an upgrade here. This is just a constructed card. I'm going to give Indomitable Creativity an F. Do not put this in your deck. I, you're just, you're just, if you build a typical draft deck, right? You're going to have twos, threes, and fours. Let's say you target some tokens. You're, what if you just hit some two drops? You just ca spent a bunch of mana to just turn your one ones into two twos, and that's just not good enough. Next up, we have Skewer the Critics. Two in a red for a sorcery with Spectacle Red. Spectacle Red means you may cast a spell for its spectacle cost rather than its mana cost if an opponent lost life this turn. Skewer the Critics deals three damage to any target. So three mana sorcery, deal three damage to any target. Sure, fine removal spell. But if you can hit them, the spectacle for one does make it pretty solid. But that doesn't happen all the time. I think it's just a solid removal spell. I'm going to give Skewer the Critics a C, maybe a C plus if you are aggressively slanted. Next, we have Skullcrack, one in a red for an instant. Players can't gain life this turn. Don't think that happens that much in limited anyways. Damage can't be prevented this turn. Skullcrack deals three damage to target player or planeswalker. You know what this card reads? At the beginning of your, at the, um, if this card is in your opening hand, you are down a card. That's what this card says for the most part. Just straight face burn spells has never really been a card that you want to play in limited. This is no exception. Skullcrack, Skulk, wow. That's my, that was just completely unintentional. Not skull crap, even though it is skull crap. Skull crack is unplayable. It is an F. Do not take this card. So that rounds out all of the cards that we've gone over for red in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. And let us now move into what I believe are the top five red commons in the set. Alrighty, coming in at number five, we have the Irascible Wolverine. Two in a red for a three, two. I think this is just a really solid creature that you're just going to be playing in every single one of your red decks. It's just too easy to get an extra card out of this. So I think it's just a really nice value creature to play in your deck. And um, just pretty happy to have this in all of my decks. I just think, you know, three mana, three, two draw card, which this is in a lot of instances, is pretty nice. The plot allows you to set up double spell turns on top of that too. So I think this is just going to be a solid, solid creature in most decks that you play. Number four, we have Thunder Salvo, one in a red. Now, if you can guarantee that this deals three damage every time you cast it, of course, this would be higher up on the rankings, but I just feel like more often than not, this is gonna be two mana to deal two damage with about maybe a quarter of the time you cast it, it dealing three damage. And if that's the case, then I just don't know that it's quite as good as you would want it to be. So I, ha I still think it's solid and I'm gonna play it in all my decks, but I that's why I have it at number four and not somewhere a little bit higher. Coming in at number three, the one drop, the reckless lackey. I mean, you have to push a one drop to its limits for me to put it this high. 
Uh, Reckless Lackey, I think, is awesome. I wouldn't be shocked if this goes up in the list. This might make it to number two. I don't think it's going to hit number one, but Reckless Lackey is a one red, one two, first strike haste. If you're playing a red aggressive beatdown strategy, this just gets in there for a few points of damage. And then in the late game, you can still sacrifice this to draw a card and get a treasure. Like, I feel like it would be fine if you got a treasure or drew a card, but this does both? This is just so much for one mana. So I just think this card's great. Uh, you should take this pretty highly, especially if the aggressive archetype is heavily supported. If aggressive decks are good, this is going to be great. Next up, we have Explosive Derailment. Now, in a lot of formats, I might have had this as the number one common, but uh, it's at number two for a reason. But this card is very good. I mean, it's just three mana, instant speed, basically kill 80% of the creatures your opponents can play. I think this is really solid. Instant speed is nice because you can also just kind of blow your people, blow your opponents out. So, and every now and then, if you just get an artifact with the four damage, like that's just, that's just, I, your opponents just will fall off their chair. So I think this card is just an amazing removal spell. And um, this is, this is, I'm pretty confident this is going to end up in the top three, no matter what, you know, two months from now. And coming in at number one, not surprising, the Prickly Pear. The Prickly Pear, two and a red for a 2-2 plant mercenary. ETBs make another mercenary token. I just think historically, these effects have been awesome. This is just a, a it puts a pair of mercenaries onto the battlefield. There's a lot of cards that care about having mercenaries in play. The fact that the 1-1 also pumps your creatures is nice. There's a, a go wide spell at common that... Works really, really well with this as well. So I just I just think this card, you know, these effects just always end up overperforming initial projections. And I don't think anything's going to be different here. So Prickly Pear is my top common for Outlaws of Thunder Junction for red. So there you have it, folks. We have completed red. We are almost done. We're at the home stretch. We have green left to go. And then the gold cards and the colorless cards. But wow, there are a ton of gold cards. So that one is going to be probably an extra long video. But thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Feel free to hit the like or subscribe button for more daily videos just like this. If you wanted to support the content in another way, I did launch my Patreon channel. We have a Discord where we talk all things limited and a little bit of constructed. The link to the, link to the Patreon is in the description below. Green, coming up next. I'll see you tomorrow.